My name is Bob Wells. I have the privilege today of moderating the, this forum, which is sponsored by the Johnson County Task Force on Aging. Our chair, Larry Cucci, is suffering from a little cold and cannot talk too well, so I'm filling in for him. We have invited our, the legislators from Johnson County to be here today to share with us their perspective of the upcoming session of the General Assembly that begins on Monday. We also have invited them here to hear your concerns and to react to those. So if you have uh, a concern or a legislative proposal, uh, please share them. Uh, I have the names of some people who wish to be called upon, and I'll do that, and then uh, we'll open it to the general public. But, um, Senator, you and I have been doing this a long time. Yeah, we have been. Uh, so, tell these people and those watching on TV what you expect of the 2016 legislative session, and what things are you going to be championing? Um, I'd be happy to. <laughs> uh, Bob, thanks for the thanks for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we start, I said, Bob, how many years have we been doing these? And a while, um, but it's good to be here. We're all getting older. Um, <laughs> so, at any rate, the uh, so we go back Monday. Uh, the I guess a little bit about the interim. Uh, you know, we finished the session back in May. Um, one of the big things that has happened over the summer is uh, kind of trying to figure out how to move forward with Governor uh, Branstad's unilateral decision to privatize the state Medicaid program, a program that serves nearly 600,000 Iowans, uh, makes up about $4.2 billion worth of, of federal and state spending. For every dollar we spend, the feds give us about 55 cents, and the and state taxpayers put in about 45 cents. And, over the interim, we've been hearing a lot of concern from providers and consumers who rely on these essential services. Uh, uh, the governor's decision to put essentially all the populations, whether it's kids or moms or people that got insurance under the Affordable Care Act, seniors, people with disabilities, people with mental health issues, uh, essentially anybody on the program under, under the managed care uh, uh, umbrella is is something that we haven't seen in other states. Uh, certainly, managed care has been around. Uh, it's been used by various population and for various populations. Even here in Iowa, we we've man used managed care to manage some of the 4.2 billion dollars we're spending this year. Uh, we've hired now, I think, three companies. Initially, four companies, but one didn't tell the truth in the application process and was uh, taken out of the running. And so right now the Department of Human Services, and they, I believe they are going to be in the courts appealing that decision. But uh, DHS has basically said we now have three companies and we're proceeding forward with three companies. So a lot of our time uh, up front here has been hearing from constituents and providers about kind of the disastrous rollout of this. We, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, the federal government, the Obama administration told uh, Governor Branstead uh, we'd, he's not ready uh, to start on January 1st, which was last, I guess, just in the last week, uh, and gave us another 60 days um, to try and get people signed up, provide, get provider networks in place. So I suspect, the, so, the, so that's been the interim. As we go back to work, one of the things I think we're going to be interested in is making sure we put in place some stronger over legislative oversight. Uh, one of the questions during the interim is how does the governor have the power to do this without the legislature's approval? Uh, and there's some disagreement about that. In the past, we've had to get the legislature's approval to do what we call get a waiver from the way Medicaid ordinarily runs, a waiver to do it differently. And the, uh, the attorney general apparently told the governor he had the power to do it. So one of the one of the bills that's going to be filed is going to be a bill that basically says any big changes like this ought to have legislative approval going forward. You know, the, the deal the deal's been done on this, but uh, that's out there. And then just better oversight. It's really challenging for legislators. We're part time. This is all really complicated. Uh, we do have an oversight committee that met twice this fall. And you're a member of that and, and I am a member of the committee, but I can just tell you I've put a lot of time in on this. This is really complicated stuff. And one of the things in the oversight bill I think we're going to push for the Senate Democrats uh, is 
being able to hire our own third party independent help to help us evaluate what DHS and the governor's office is telling us. We've had numerous meetings and frankly don't really, unfortunately, I, I say this with great uh, um, concern and disappointment, but we just, we, we haven't been able to trust much of what we hear out of, the, out of the Department of Human Services in terms of the meetings we've had and hiding information, not telling us the truth. So we feel like we need our own well-informed expertise to advise the legislative branch about how this is going and what kind of changes we might see going forward. So that's, that's a big issue, big health care issue. It affects lots of folks. I don't think anybody in this, like 600,000 families nearly affected, right? So it's a lot of people. Uh, probably the biggest single change in of a state policy of anything we've I've seen in the 16 or 17 years I've been in the state legislature. Uh, looking ahead to the budget, budget's going to be really tight. Uh, there's been a bunch of stories in the paper the last week with our legislative leaders on both sides at meetings talking about the budget. Um, we've given up a lot in this property, industrial commercial property tax cut. Uh, we've had to pay for it and we're still paying for it and it's reduced our ability to fund our kids and schools and our healthcare system and uh, public safety, et cetera. So I think we'll spend some time on that. Probably the biggest initial fight or discussion or debate will be how much money are we going to give our K-12 schools. Uh, we left the session last year with a, an agreement, a bipartisan agreement to add some additional money and the governor vetoed that in July. And uh, we're going to, that's probably the first order of business. I'll let others uh, give their opinions about, about that and know more about it than I do. But, those are, those are just a few issues that I think we'll be tackling soon. What am I going to work on? I'm going to work on all of that. Uh, probably mostly on the Medicaid stuff. I may be working on some energy issues around uh, solar energy, some expansion of that, some wind energy work, um, and some energy efficiency work on that side. And maybe some, hopefully some water quality uh, initiatives as well. Uh, thanks for being here. Senator Kenny. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Last year was a very interesting first year to be in the state uh, Senate. Uh, I, uh, I've gotten my eyes opened up a little bit. Uh, we, this year, we left the Des Moines thinking that we had a bipartisan agreement that uh, we had worked out. We went late, our session, and we got home and found out that the governor had vetoed uh, our proposals. Uh, not only that, on the mental health institutions, closing the, the two <clears throat> mental health institutions in uh, Clarinda and Mount Pleasant. I, um, I serve on the Ag Committee, so I'm working a lot on the water quality initiative, uh, nutrient reduction strategies. Um, I'm also on uh, the Judiciary Committee, and uh, I've been working a lot actually with the, some of the different people across the aisles on some human trafficking le just legislation, trying to uh, come up with a way, find a way that we can fund uh, officers that would specifically work on uh, human trafficking. Uh, that's something that uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time on, along with going to meetings about the Medicaid and, and uh, turning that over to uh, the privatization. Uh, so those are along with, and I'm also on the education committee and I see that this year is when we get to Des Moines trying to get something worked out where we can get a livable uh, supplemental state aid uh, for our schools. Uh, that's something that I feel that we've been uh, neglecting and uh, those are our, the people that are going to be running uh, the state of Iowa and probably not so, so just such a long time. So uh, we need to be able to educate these uh, kids. That's your turn. Coming. Well, thank you and thank you for having the forum today. Uh, the senators laid out pretty much what the 2016 session will look like. The only, the only thing I'll disagree with them on is us House members, we're not getting any older. 
So, uh, 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 Representative Kaufman does send his regrets. Uh, we do start the session on Monday. Many of us moving to Des Moines over the weekend, and some of his farm chores call them before it starts to freeze tomorrow and tomorrow night. Uh, everyone here at, at the table uh, has prided ourselves individually and collectively with working with people across the aisle. Uh, sadly, it's not true in terms of the governor's office. In fact, every time the governor says, please trust me, I check for my billfold. Because every time he says that, it means some money's gonna fly out of our pocket and go elsewhere. His latest pyramid scheme is the, the education and water quality proposal, which basically is a shuffling act and taking money away from our school districts. But even more importantly to me, coming from local government, takes away some of the jurisdiction of local government to determine how that money is used. In essence, our school boards. Uh, I hope, starting Monday, that we do work on the education piece first and come out with a, an acceptable, allowable growth figure. I also hope that we reinstate the water quality money that was originally there. It was part of the governor's veto. And uh, on the front line, uh, I've been working with many families regarding the Medicaid switcheroo or privatization or whatever phrase you want to use. I think it is important for people to remember when we talk about Medicaid privatizing that as Senator Bolcom and Senator Kinney have referenced, this is tax dollars. This isn't privatized saying we won't have it as a function of government anymore. It means all of our tax dollars, federal and state, are going to private entities that say they can save 51 million, but by the way, that was downgraded to 42 million two weeks ago. But 51 million total in savings, but not a single sheet of paper to show us how indeed that will occur not even an indication of what category, maybe what families or individuals it may affect, nothing. It's trust me, we're gonna have $51 million in savings. And people have asked me, that's a little strong saying it's a pyramid scheme. And I think it's a little soft. Pyramid schemes are basically, someone gets in at the beginning, they're at the base of that pyramid, keep the money coming in, and that, that would be those three private companies. but fail or successful, they pocket $20 million off the top. So in two to three years, they could be gone. And there's no penalty for those companies. They can take the 20 million and say, oops, sorry, we tried, but it did not work. That's what work concerns me even more. Is that, and that's why I reference it as a pyramid scheme. But I am very positive on this next session. Because again, we've worked with many people across the aisle. Uh, I know Mary and Sally have already received phone calls from House Republicans saying, we wanna work with you on a reasonable, allowable growth for schools. A couple of them have said, we're fighting our leadership on this. And I think this year we have a good opportunity for a reasonable, allowable growth. And also a review of some of the tax credits that we've been dishing out for years. Uh, and I, I support tax credits, but what I don't support is the fact that we give them and we don't review them annually. If that's not enough, I hope I do look forward to your questions. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start in. I'm Mary Masher, <laughs> state rep from House District 86. And I wanna thank Bob for setting up the forum and for all of you for attending today. I appreciate you being here. Look forward to your questions. I'm gonna keep my comments brief. I just wanted to say that there is a special election. You may wonder why I have an I voted sticker on. January 19th is a special election to replace Terrence Nugel and on the County Board of Supervisors. And we're just encouraging everyone to remember to vote. You can vote early at the auditor's office and you can also vote uh, at satellite locations, both here at the Coralville Public Library and Iowa Cities and a number of other locations around town. So I just want to encourage you to remember that and get out and vote. Um, in terms of your oil priorities, 
gee, these aren't new. <laughs> um, we have been seeing these same priorities and have been trying to work in a bipartisan fashion with a number of our colleagues in the House and Senate to get these provisions through. And as you know, we have been stymied in our efforts. The governor doesn't put him in his budget priorities, and therefore it's a much steeper hill to climb when it comes to getting it through legislatively. And that's what's unfortunate. We have a governor that doesn't support many of these provisions because he doesn't support an additional dollar going to any budget area. And that becomes a real challenge for us when we're trying to fund, fund education, human services, all of our other priorities are, that are out there. The courts um, have been underfunded for years. Um, in terms of what I'm gonna work for, Bob, here you go. Education, preschool, K-12, community colleges, and our public universities, and our private institutions. Quite frankly, we need education funding for all of those across the board. And I'm working with our Republican colleagues in the House to try to move those, that agenda forward. Um, at the university level, they are working specifically on faculty salaries so that we can retain and attract the best and the brightest to our state. Our institutions rely on a good faculty and faculty base that are going to provide that education for our students. And we need to make sure that those um, institutions are well funded as well. With the K-12 system, we're looking at that third grade retention and trying to see if we can tweak that in some ways to make it workable. If school districts don't have the money to provide a quality summer school program, we're gonna be in a world of hurt. There are over 6,000 children that will be enrolled in those summer school programs if we retain all of those kids who are not proficient in reading at the end of uh, third grade, or second grade it would be, before they go into third. So those are the, the issues that we're going to be facing, and if the state isn't willing to fund that, it's gonna be very difficult for districts to be able to offer a quality summer program for those kids who need it the most. Um, water quality, you may have seen something in the paper about the governor sh shifting dollars away from our K-12 schools for infrastructure to the water quality initiatives that we need so badly in the state. I am very supportive of improving our water quality and looking for ways to go about that. This is not the right approach. You don't pay, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul. I think Senator Gronstall said it the best in terms of this is just a shift and it doesn't solve either problem because it's not enough going forward to be able to accomplish that. Um, solar tax credits, I'd like to see those continued and extended in future years for other people to take advantage of that. I think it's important. What I'm gonna work against are tax credits and tax cuts that are not sustainable. It makes no sense for us to have a smaller pie to distribute to education and healthcare, and again, all of our priorities, if we are not looking at the tax credits that are already out there and determining are they or are they not working. Um, last, legislation that will limit a woman's right to choose. We have seen that time and time again, and those are the kinds of things we know are important to the people here in this community, and we will fight to make sure that those rights are maintained. So again, thank you. I appreciate being here and look forward to your questions. Sally? Thanks, Bob. And Bob, I'm not afraid to admit it. We go back a long time, <laughs> yes, and I um, appreciate continually uh, how much work you do to... Uh, I knew Sally before she ever ran for the Board of Supervisors. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving we'll right along, we'll Bob. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you for, for hosting this and, and for um, um, coming this afternoon. You know, it's always great to see an interested group of people, a knowledgeable group of people about what's going, what we're facing with the legislature. And I also want to thank my colleagues. I mean, Mary, she is just so good on education. You know, I, we just are so fortunate to have the representation that we have with this uh, delegation. And I'm not necessarily speaking about myself, but uh, they're very seasoned and they really know their stuff and they all work really, really hard. Um, I represent House District 77, which is the southern, southern and uh, western part of Johnson County. Uh, the committees I serve on are transportation, ag, uh, state government, uh, probes, and then uh, health and human services budget subcommittee. Um, some of the things that um, I'm 
knowing that we're going to be worried, the budget's going to just, I think, override a lot of what we're going to be doing this year. And um, that and school funding, um, I was um, uh, very um, involved in the um, gas tax last year, and I thought it was a great strategy. We dealt with that early, and we got it out of the way. And I'm hoping that we may have learned from that and we'll get uh, school funding done early and get it taken care of so that w it just won't linger on for the whole session like we did last year. You know, I think it, we've all uh, expressed our frustration in sitting there at the legislature well over a month after uh, we should have been done talking about education funding and going home uh, thinking that we had reached a good faith compromise and then to have it vetoed by the governor. That was just incredibly disheartening and really, um, really disappointing. So I certainly hope that we don't go down that route again. Um, I think um, I mentioned the budget and school funding. One of the things that I would like to work on is a uh, texting ban. Now I've heard uh, um, you know, the House isn't real crazy about it on the uh, Transportation Committee, but the Senate is. And so I will be working closely with Todd Bowman to try to get something in place. Uh, I think probably um, one good strategy is to get the insurance companies involved because I just think this is creating a lot of um, uh, uh, problems in the state, a lot more than we realize. And the reading that I've done about the dangers of texting, are, are, I just don't know how we can continue not to um, uh, see the uh, validity and having some kind of texting ban. But it's an election year, so we'll see uh, how that goes. Uh, I think the House side is going to be an interesting um, uh, transition this year. We have new leadership. Craig Paulson um, stepped down. Linda Upmeyer is our new leader. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Linda. I haven't worked with her a lot, so uh, it remains to be seen how she will handle that role. I'm sure she's very competent, but um, we will uh, see. We also have changes in the Appropriations Committee. Um, uh, Chuck Soderberg, who um, was on the committee for a number of years, I certainly enjoyed working with him. He was uh, uh, worked hard. He uh, did a, a great job of um, informing the committee and keeping us uh, moving along, and we have a new appropriations chair this year who will be Chuck Grassley, or not Chuck, I'm sorry, his uh, nephew. Um, uh, well, will that be, was kind of a Freudian. So. Was it? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, he'll be a probes chair, and so we will uh, see how that, uh, how that goes. Uh, also, there's a new uh, chair of the Ag Committee. I serve on the Ag Committee, and uh, Lee Hine from Monticello will be the uh, new Ag Committee chair. Um, um, he's, he farms. Uh, I hope that we can continue to work on nutrient strategies and uh, uh, making sure that we have additional funding, uh, funding there. Um, I think one of the things that um, we'll be working on in state government is I'm hearing rumblings that fantasy sports is going to come up again. And um, uh, that is just something um, I am not convinced that it's not gambling and that this isn't just another form of gambling. And so I think we need to be very, very careful about uh, whether we want to introduce that uh, legally in the state of Iowa. Uh, there will be some licensure issues. You know, some groups have approached me about wanting to be licensed, and lots of this has to do with their reimbursement for their services. So I think we need to uh, look at that. Uh, like everybody else up here, I've had constant emails about the Medicaid uh, fiasco and what a mess that is. And I just feel um, so bad for families that are having to deal with this. Uh, I, and the words can't even describe how disappointing this has been. You know, people complain about government doesn't work and blah, blah, blah. Well, government did work in providing these services. Now it is not working because of the absolute chaos and the poor job that um, the administration has done in rolling out this huge, huge, huge initiative. And there again, I just, I just feel so bad for the families that are just having to go through this undue stress, um, you know, concerning about pro uh, services for their loved ones, and um, and that's not what government should be doing. Um, let's see. I to, I've had attended a lot of meetings in this interim about. Uh, businesses and skilled workforce and how they constantly say we need to have a skilled workforce in Iowa. That's the most, one of the most important things for businesses. And yet at the same time, we have an administration that continues to cut our funding for schools. Well, I don't know how we're going to get a skilled workforce if we don't uh, support our schools. So that will be something that I will really be working for is um, supporting our schools because that's where our skilled workforce is going to come from. 
So I look forward to your questions, and uh, we'll turn it back to Bob. Hey, thank you all very much. Uh, Senator Bulkin just wrote me a note that talking about long time. He said we first met in 1988 mm. uh, when he was with a group called Senior Advocates in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and he was seeking funding from the Heritage Area Agency on Aging. And at that time, I was chair of that uh, budget committee. And uh, my memory, Joe, I hope this is right. I was supportive of your application. I love you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> like we're, we're pitching for money, and Bob goes, I like this. Boy. Um, no, no, let, let me ask you, Joe, I know you're on that legislative committee on yeah. Medicaid. The letter keeps referring to gate two, two readiness. Yeah. Have you all looked at that gate two readiness, what it really involves? And when I look at the CMS letter and why they say you're not ready on January 1, and uh, is there any way you think that they can be ready by March 1st? Um, the, I don't think, I mean, the short answer, no, I don't think they are going to be ready on March 1st. Um, there, there are probably going to be disagreement about that. So uh, CMS came and said uh, to the department, it's pretty clear that the providers, net the networks aren't in place. If we're going to uh, let this go forward, uh, patients need to know they have a hospital and, and a primary care provider and all the other kinds of services, and, and those were not adequate. There are a number of, uh, I, I think of them as checklists. The gate, I've, I, I haven't looked at the gate two checklist lately, but it's several pages long. It's all these measures that have to be met in order for the green light to go on, right? And so I haven't looked at that lately. Um, it's a, and so it, it concerns me that they're not gonna be ready. We did see some numbers this morning on number of providers the department is updating that on a regular basis. There's a website. We got some email this morning from our staff about the percent of providers that have signed up with the, each of now the three MCOs. Um, they, there's a lot of work to do. I think as we get back to work next week, I think our job will be to get contact with CMS again and uh, get their take on what one are they. We'd like you to come back to Iowa uh, and continue to interact with providers and consumers prior to giving the green light. Uh, are you planning to do that uh, sometime, I assume, maybe in mid-February uh, to see if, see if it's ready? I think actually the delay was, was welcome news uh, to the MCOs. Uh, you know, they, they signed these contracts in October. Uh, there's 30,000 providers, and so each of those companies had to go out and get contracts signed, <coughs> negotiate rates, sign up 100,000 plus people, I mean, it was an enormous amount of work for these companies to do. And I think they've, they've benefited by being able to have a little bit of additional time. Um, but again, I mean, the legislature, we, we, are not, we are in a very weak position to be able to make much of a mark here. We, the, the CMS folks told us they've never gotten the kind of response from people in Iowa, both providers and consumers, meaning they've never had so many contacts about the problems uh, with this rollout. I think Representative Stutzman kind of hit it on the head. You know, it's just been a chaos for people and families. And so, uh, so I think we're going to be closer, but um, it seemed like the, the eight week delay was kind of, we were hoping for six months. Um, it seems like it's still going to be fairly hasty to try and move forward on March 1st. So, you, you know, I respect you, okay? Yeah. But you mentioned about you're going to hope that to get a funding for a third party. Yeah. Is that even realistic? Um, we, we, the, so we established, uh, the Senate passed uh, like a 14-page oversight bill during the session. The House, controlled by the Republicans, did not take that up. Okay, it was a rigorous bill, got a lot of feedback from people that know stuff about managed care, say, you got to do this, 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 this. We pass a bill. Actually, it passed in the Senate 50 to nothing, and then it went to the House and they didn't take it up. On the last day of the session, we passed one paragraph with 46 words in it that was the Oversight Committee. And so we had two Oversight Committee meetings, one November, one December, and the Republicans on the committee, we had a fight with the chair of the committee about even having things on the agenda, 
Like they didn't want to have, they wanted to be like, only people that like this and think it's going well can talk. So we won't go along with that. We want to hear from providers and consumers. And so we fought about that. So the Republicans, and, and we put up a couple of different motions at each meeting to delay for six months, and they failed on party line votes because the committee has five Democrats, five Republicans. And you got to get majority votes, and we couldn't do it. So they, uh, to delay, not even to delay, to, say, to ask the governor if he would delay it because we don't have any power. So the Republicans have been very reluctant to criticize the governor, criticize this effort, or to do meaningful oversight. So will we get the House, if the Senate passes a bill that says we can spend a couple hundred thousand dollars or some amount of money to hire a third party independent uh, advice and support to our questions and our ability to get information, uh, the House is probably not going to take that up. Right? But we're going to have that conversation because I think it's an important one to have. The other thing to talk about that we've talked about is the issue of subpoena power, but I, I'm not sure that gives us much in terms of being able to compel people to come talk. It's, as I said earlier, it's been very disappointing working with the Department of Human Services and Chuck Palmer and his operation. The, we've not been able to take much stock in much of what they tell us. And that is a really bad place to be. If the main people implementing this change, you don't trust what they tell you. So we're going back to work. We'll be meeting with folks right, right out of the chute to kind of get up to date on where we are right now. But we have a really strained relationship at this point. For those of you who do not know, uh, the task force had a meeting on managed care where Mickey Steer from IME, I have Medicaid Enterprise, and at that time the four MCOs. Uh, Joe said at the end of the meeting, hey, will you come back next September and tell us what in the heck you've done? Uh, I think I reported to you, Joe. I got commitments from all four of those, and I reviewed that yesterday, uh, and from Mickey Steer. So in September, keep your calendars open, because they're going to be back here uh, sharing with the legislators and all, and I appreciate, Joe, you're asking that question, but uh, a, a suggestion. My guess is that if you ask citizens in Iowa City to contribute to a $200,000 to be able to have a third party independent look at it, you could raise $200,000. I'll be one of the first to contribute. Kevin, let me ask you. You, you, you and Mary talked about the wa water quality, and I think most citizens realize we have a lot of endangered waterways in Iowa. Uh, I read recently, as you probably did, uh, Jack Hatch uh, had a solution on the 28th. He wrote about Iowa water and land legacy. Uh, have you seen that? Um, I did read. I did yeah. read it in the Des Moines Register. Yeah. Uh, but uh, any reactions to that? I know Mary didn't like the governor's proposal. What's your view? My view on the water quality initiative. Uh, I think that we need to educate urban and rural people need to come together and get some, and have some education uh, and try to come up with a workable solution. Um, when you start mandating people to do um, Des Moines Water Works, the, the lawsuit that was uh, filed in Des Moines, when you are forcing this upon uh, farmers, you're, you're making one group of individuals individuals ought to be the, the people that are doing all the, the the things that are wrong. I think that there's there's ways in, in which we can work with the farmers uh, and the urban people. When I met with the uh, EPA when they were in Des Moines, that was one of the things that I said, we need to work at this as a group and, and quit blaming each other. Uh, there are farming practices that are that need to be changed. I, I agree with that. Um, but 
in all the meetings, I think I sat through 14 different meetings last year talking about water quality and some of the, the things that have been implemented, uh, the, uh, the border strips, the, uh, uh, the, the different uh, measures that have been taken place, and they are, for the most part, seeing a reduction in, uh, in nitrates that are coming into the water streams. Um, two years ago, again, the, there was a bill that was going to stop all the, the drainage wells in northwest Iowa, and that was going to, to be one-time spending, and the governor vetoed, came in and line item vetoed that, and there would have been a, a considerable uh, amount of money then that we could have spread out over uh, some of these other practices. Uh, so those are the things that I'm going to be trying to to uh, work on to see if we can uh, get to everybody at the table and, and try to come up with some solutions without uh, having to do this uh, or being forced into it. Mary, uh, can, I, can I say sure. something on water quality sure. quickly? Be, because it, it's, it's not about water quality. That's what upsets me the most. This whole discussion has nothing to do with water quality. The uh, baseline that everyone accepts is that water quality in Iowa sucks. I'm sorry, stinks. That water quality stinks. The question now is who's going to pay for it? That's the question that's on the table with the lawsuit, and that's the question that we're all facing now. We need to improve water quality. I'd like to go back to the day where I could eat all the fish I caught whether it's out of Indian Creek, whether it's out of the Res, whether it's out of the Mississippi. It's about who's going to pay for it. And this is why the governor's proposal is kind of a scam, because what you're doing is using your saved dollars, your sales tax dollars, and diverting them from schools to water quality. Well, what that also does, and I know we don't always agree on this, is it's using a lot of urban dollars to clean out the waterways in rural Iowa. I'm getting to a point now with my experience in the legislature is it's time to pay for what you do or what you, how you affect those systems. So I, it's shifting the money not only from education to who pays for water, but it's shifting it even more so from urban to rural. Don't hit me. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Mary, the uh, good news is uh, Larry and I and two others from the old Irish legislature met with the governor uh, on Monday and again with uh, Mike Gonstrad, and we have a meeting on the 19th scheduled with Linda Upmeyer. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, governor was very much in support of the CARE Act uh, Mike said he would uh, allow it to be voted on if it got out of a House committee. Uh, his feeling was, why should the Senate take up something they know is not going to go any place? Uh, I got mixed feelings on that one. Uh, the uh, uh, governor, in terms of uh, appropriate facility for sexual aggressive people uh, recognizes that probably what the state needs to do is a separate facility for that. Uh, in terms of funding, we would sure hope that uh, there would be sustainable funding for lifelong links uh, as an information center. And in the area of elder abuse, that there would be really an emphasis on data collection. Because, you know, we still have a lot of people that says, hey, there's no elder abuse in my county. Uh, there are several people here that would like to uh, make comments that I know about. Uh, one is a gentleman that I don't have never even met, Don Mitchell from Access to Independence. Uh, 
Don, you want to come up and use this microphone so that uh, the cameras can also pick you up, uh, since this is being uh, televised by Coles Television. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming for this. I work for Access to Independence in Cedar Rapids in Iowa City. We're a center for independent living. We've been here since 1979. I started working here in September. And one of the things that I've come across is I don't understand why we're not involved with the um, Money Follows the Person program with the Department of Human Services. I currently have a consumer who is in a nursing home. The nursing home agrees that she doesn't need to be there. The person does not want to be there. And yet, they're paying $6,000 a month from Medicaid to keep her there for the last three years. We can't get a, we can't get a um, physical disability waiver for her. And not only that, but the state of Iowa says the only people that can move under money follows the person are people with intellectual disabilities and people with uh, brain injuries. That's discrimination in the use of federal funding. And I just would like to know what we could get you folks to do to get the governor's office to look at this. The last thing we need is another Olmstead lawsuit. Thank you. Anyone want to answer that? But, yeah. I, th I'd be, I think any of us would be happy to, to look into this specific case. I mean, this is kind of a, a right. really out there example. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe other people are in that circumstance, but uh, we'd, I'd be happy to do follow up with you after this to okay. try and help this person try and get, get on, the, on the waiver. Uh, all the people that are on the waiver are going to be under the managed care companies right. so people are getting moved and there's some uncertain you know that's kind of scary for folks right case managers are going to change um, in the next six months and uh, so I, I think there's some just in, in terms of what what is going to be the legislature's role to establish policy around health care especially right. in this area where money should follow the, the person uh, when we've created this new layer of administration and given such great power to these three Wall Street companies to manage this money, uh, where do the policy committees of the legislature come in when we want to create a, a new program or improve a program? Or uh, So that, that's kind of a big question that we still have to figure out with this new operation that's been put in front of us. And see, the other, the other point that I would like to make is, is that we are mandated by federal law and they just added a fifth core service for us to have, and that's called transition services. We provide independent living skills training, we provide advocacy, we provide information referral, and we provide peer support. But we can't provide transition services because we have no way to get people out. Right. The only so, people we're actually transitioning right now would be students that are transitioning from high school into the community, you know, into so, adult life. And we need to be doing what we're supposed to do, and, and the legislature, not the legislator, but the policies right. need to be changed so that we can do our job. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you may know that according to the ARP's document on state by state, Iowa, they say, has the most people in nursing homes that do not need that level of care of any state. Uh, and as Don pointed out, uh, it's a lot cheaper in home and community-based services. Now, uh, Dave Heaton, who's the co-chair of the Judicial Committee, uh, some of us have been strong advocates of home and community-based services. And Dave has said, under managed care, you're going to get that, that many of the managed care organizations are going to say, hey, this person doesn't need to be in a nursing home. So, Coleman Community-Based Service. Yeah. The one problem is that in most rural Iowa, there isn't home and community-based services. That's June Judge, 
who all of you know. June is probably one of the strongest advocates in the area of mental health that I know of. June? Thank you, and thank you for all of the many years of work you've done. You're, you're a hero. Mm -hmm. And the rest of you, too. I've known you. 1979 is when my son got sick. And 1979 is when I first learned about mental illness. And I'm a teacher. I worked with students that had mental health problems, although they didn't call it that. They called it, you know, attention deficit disorder and a lot of other things. Now, I learned as I began my, my journey that education was the key. But I also learned, and I'm here with all of you folks who are now in the senior situation, I was working with less than. I was working with children who had less than potential. I was working with adults who, when they got sick, all of a sudden, access can testify to that, they were less than. And now I'm with the senior citizens, and I always knew they were less than. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm one, of course. <laughs> and so I'm up here to say the key in my mind continues to be education. And I was working with Magellan Merritt. I was the first family advocate. It was the devils in the details. And they had to, in their contract with Chuck Palmer and Governor Branstead at that time, they had to write in the need for a family advocate. And because I had been vocal, and I was with NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, they hired me. And I saw firsthand, these were serious mental illness that these folks were working with. They didn't have the gamut. You're working now with the gamut of all the disabilities. Big one. <laughs> and I saw these people in the little corrals. I was in the little corral right beside them. They learned from their own experience. They learned what worked for the people, and they, they talked with the folks in the communities. And then, also in the contract, was reinvestment dollars. And this is a biggie, biggie, biggie. I don't know about the other three folks now. Do they have that in the contract? Out of the profits, they are to reinvest with Merritt Magellan. Magellan is what it ended up being. They had to invest $1 million a year in programs that upgraded the, the situations for people with mental illness. Now, we brought in the PAC program, Positive Assertive Community Treatment. We brought in the Fairweather Lodges, which is, we have them, three of them here in Iowa City, which is employment for the homeless that have mental illness. We brought in the Compeer program, one-to-one -one friendships. And we brought in, there's a third, oh, intensive psychiatric rehabilitation. I want to tell you that these programs were state of the art and Magellan bought into it. Magellan brought these people to Iowa. We did training. The community mental health centers were to send their community support people to this training, which was free. And these are to work to develop a constituency of support in the state of Iowa for people with serious mental illnesses. Did it work? <laughs> I don't know, did it work? I don't see a whole lot of difference in people in jails that have mental illness. I don't see a whole lot of people with children and they're transitioning, boy, do we need that. Okay, so we start again. Oh, I want to tell you that when my son got sick, Governor Branstead was starting his first term of office. <laughs> and they had passed previously uh, federal money to come into the state to train community people in education to work with the mentally challenged and the, the uh, children IQ 72 and below, and that passed. They wanted folks in the community to work with these folks. They didn't want to put them in those little, whatever, schools somewhere. Okay, and that did a wonderful job. Well, 19, the first term of office, they did the same thing for mental illness. They had 20 components of working for, with folks with serious mental illness in the community, and they were going to educate the community people. And <laughs> The governor line item vetoed it. It was one third state money to two thirds federal money. And when he line item vetoed that, it just sent people to their, their deaths, sent them to jail and the families. Okay, so then we got the Merritt Magellan that did do some really good things because they saw firsthand what mental illness folks really um, did well. Now, I'm getting to this, the aging. <laughs> just tell me what your question is. Or... My question is. Where's the education? We still don't have education. Those individual programs that Magellan, I do want to tell you, there was no oversight of that either, because the premier programs in the nation 
had certain uh, aspects for the integrity of the programs. Well, nobody oversaw that they could line item veto Magellan, take out what they didn't want to provide. They didn't want to provide social activities. They didn't want to provide um, creativity and, and recreational. Now, my question, <laughs> with the aging, oh, hey, by the way, I uh, brought in a group back in 2004 preparing for the future care of relatives with major mental illnesses. We gave the program here in Iowa City with pharmaceutical money, because at that point, pharmacies could, if you wrote for a grant, they could provide you with that. But that got changed, and now it only goes to um, um, people that are not NAMI, National Alliance people. OK, so we found out. And the people that, that took part in that were preparing for the elder room, it was called, preparing for the elder room. And those people were um, Council of Ministries, Consumer Advocate Council of Veterans, Crisis Center, Visiting Nurses, the Community Mental Health Center, Iowa Consortium for Mental Health, which uh, Dr. Flom heads that up for Chuck Palmer, and uh, Parkinson's, and also the Consumer Outreach Program. And from that, this was given in 2004. <laughs> and from that, 65% of the adults with serious mental illness in Iowa are cared for by family. Aging caregivers need direct, we are stoic people. We're taking care of our own folks from the cradle to the grave, literally. So, you, so your question is, yeah, I have a question Go ahead. for the, uh, my daughter-in-law now is in the rehab center out here. It's a long-term care for mental illness, not mental illness, no, 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 medical. And all of these folks that are in Chatham Oaks and others are getting older, and they go into nursing homes. And I say they're going into nursing homes because of medical conditions. Other men, my daughter-in-law is seriously diabetic. She's had strokes. Okay, when they get into these nursing homes, uh, who is training the staff to work with people with serious mental illness that are coming into the nursing homes. There, that's my question. I finally got to it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Any of you want to comment on mental health? Can I start with just, um, first of all, June, thank you so much for all you have done for the mental health issues in the state. You don't only advocate for here, you advocate statewide and nationwide. And NAMI has been a big partner in working with you, and I know that you've utilized their resources as well. One of the things I was going to say is, and, and this you will probably you know, identify as well, in this community, our senior center offers a lot of services, both for elderly and for those who have elderly with mental illness. And so they have support services available through that senior center that are available and it's all that education you talked about because it's through classes it's helping people get signed up for Medicaid and Medicare it's helping people maneuver through the the vast array of systems that are out there where they don't have that kind of expertise the other one that I was just going to mention and a lot of us on this panel were at this particular forum uh, Attorney General's office just offered a class for seniors on fraud and abuse, how oftentimes they are the victims of that and what they could do to help prevent that. And so those kinds of programming, um, those are important and we should do, do that more often, make it statewide. They d had many of those throughout the state of Iowa. But again, I said you need to offer it through the TV, you need to offer it through our local channel you know, services so that people have better access to that who couldn't get there. Because it was good information, but we recognized that not everybody, it was packed, it was a full house that day, and they went through uh, consumer fraud, they went through Medicaid fraud, they went through a number of areas and had representatives there to talk to, and then also stayed after so that people could talk about their individual concerns, and then had contact information for people to call. So we need to be doing more outreach with Iowans to make sure that they have that available to them. I have one more thing. Uh, Linda Upmeyer, uh -huh. you know her father, right? Del Stromer. Yeah. And when we were starting our NAMIs across the state of Iowa, we wanted to do county by county the way the ARC people had done it. And so we had one in Franklin County, NAMI of Franklin County, and that man came to a meeting. It was the wow. only time that a legislator came to a meeting of NAMI 
uninvited. He didn't come to speak. He came to listen. He came to listen. And he did say, now, when you get all your needs met, you won't need NAMI anymore. And I said, oh, praise the Lord. We're going to get our needs met. <laughs> well, his daughter is now a Speaker of the House, right? right? And I've written to her a couple times to say, your father was one of the most interested and open-minded and curious legislators, the only one that I had ever met. Well, I haven't heard from her. I haven't heard from her. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. June, I was just going to say, you talk about who's going to train these people in dealing with uh, individuals with mental illness. You know, one of the critical things we have in this state is finding skilled workers to work in, in uh, nursing homes or in um, care facilities. I mean, it's, I, I think it's one of those issues that we kind of keep pushing the can down the road, but sooner or later. Uh, so it's finding the workers initially, and then, um, you know, uh, somehow we need to have that training in place. You're exactly and right. we can. We can do it. We can do it. Uh, okay. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. My name is Renee Riffey, owner of Right at Home Home Care based out of Cedar Rapids. Um, I'm here to uh, ask you if you are aware of a proposed bill, S-578, that I believe is co-authored by Senator Grassley. This bill is um, proposing to have Medicare cover some home health services. And my question is, are you aware of the bill and what your opinion is of it? Astonished that Senator Grassley would want to expand the Medicare program. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. What was the bill number again? I believe it's S578. Yes. Okay. And do you know what the status of it is at this point? I, I do not, and I'm also looking for your help and support. On, obviously, I uh, support it. Um, we are a Medicaid provider as well as a VA provider. <laughs> Uh, but quite often people, as you know, fall through the cracks um, and aren't able to get the care they need in their home. Um, and sometimes that care is minimal. Uh, sometimes that care is just helping them with cleaning their home, helping them with taking their bath, and that allows them to stay independent as long as they can. Totally. Well, and I wonder, because I have not heard uh, the bill, but it's on the federal <coughs> level. What worries me is we usually don't hear about a bill until there's a good chance that it will pass and how it affects the states and how we might change services. So only by that, it concerns me a bit that maybe the bill is not as active as hopefully it would be. Thank you. That is a real issue. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Harry Olmsted. I thank you for being here. I have two concerns that are concerns of not just the elderly, but people that are marginal in our communities. One deals with transportation, particularly paratransit. We're doing a poor job in paratransit in the rural areas in particular. Here in Johnson County, seats only goes to North Liberty three days a week three days a week to Solon, and three days a week to Tiffin. That's all they can afford to do. I want to find out what we can do at a state level to help this process. Second of all, housing, and in particular, affordable housing. As you all know, the affordable housing is of short supply and large demand here in Iowa City. I'm working with the Housing Coalition, Johnson County, uh, for affordable housing, not just here in Iowa City, but in Coralville and North Liberty. But what legislation can help take and bring about affordable housing in the state? I'll start. Um, so we have, I mean, it's kind of like the affordable housing has been a huge issue. The state has put some money into the housing tr and, and helped establish the housing trust funds mm -hmm. around the state, which we have one here, but there's ne there hasn't, there's never been enough money to uh, d meet all the needs, especially here, because the costs are higher here than a lot of places around the state. So it's going to take more state investment, uh, clear, you know, so it, more appropriation, more money. To, to the housing trust funds to see more affordable 
uh, units come on the market. And in the time we're in, just cha it's going to be a challenging time to be just blunt about getting more state resources. Um, Is that a to Joe? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a reality check. Um, Given, given kind of the, the conversation that's going on around state funding, state spending right now, there was a story in the Gazette today about how much money people think we have to spend. And as we talked about initially, uh, the, school, the schools are going to be th the first thing we need to decide on. And once we decide on how much we spend on schools, we'll have a sense of what's left over. And, and I think we're going to need like another, I don't know, $100 million uh, to the state Medicaid program. We're talking about the health care stuff for most of the meeting. There's a big chunk going going to go there. So uh, I think we're all supportive of trying to do more. The question is, uh, are, they, are the advocates organized to come in and press the legislature uh, for more funding for our housing trust funds, for example? Um, uh, on the issue of paratransit, um, we, you know, we did increase the gas tax this last year. Uh, the gas tax is a dedicated, constitutionally dedicated source of money to go to roads. I'm not very much, so the transit, the, we, we continue to struggle, I think, on, on transit funding. Uh, the pair transit to a large degree has been left up to the, the re local, the counties and regions to fund. Uh, and it's increasingly, you know, more expensive. One of the, one of the Medicaid issues on privatization is its impact on transportation. And these companies are in the, in the process of hiring third parties, another company to manage the transportation system for them. And it's, it's probably going to have, I've, I've heard from Tom Brace here uh, with SEATS, very concerned about the impact on reimbursements of an existing underfunded system. Uh, so, you know, I, I know the supervisors try as hard as they can to appropriate local property tax dollars to have a good strong pair transit system. And obviously, it'd be better to have more than three days of service to, to North Liberty, Solon, and, and Tiffin. Uh, but they're, I suspect they're, they're doing their, the best they can. But it's certainly a conversation at budget time with the supervisors right now about whether there's, there's some opportunity to throw some more money at, at seats to, to help, with this, uh, help with this issue. Um, the time, the train. So again, it's back to what's the state's budget? How can we divide it in a way that meets some of these, uh, some of these really critical needs for people, especially people with disabilities? One other thing about seats, we have 22 buses, I believe, and all of them are over 100,000 miles and some over 200,000 miles, and are being pieced together. We do have an order for four new bus buses, but that's not going to take up the slack for sure. the rest of them. It's a, on, on uh, buses, one of, the, one of the things historically that the state, we have used some of our uh, infrastructure money for is helping communities buy, buy equipment, including buses. And uh, obviously, it's time to spend some more money in that area, too. Gary, we have met um, uh, with the city manager recently, and they're building apartments and, and complexes, downtown condos, that are affordable and one of the things they're doing is working with the developers and you and I both know that that's critical in in being able to build that into new buildings and to make sure that affordable housing is really and truly affordable. Um, Jack Hatch is a great example of somebody who has done that in Des Moines, in Cedar Rapids. He has put that out throughout the state and, and has really committed himself to making sure that there are buildings built that provide housing for people who are low income and to make sure that those are available and part of the building plan. And they have done that, you know, in numbers of communities. Obviously, we need more of it, and we know that in this community. We've got a, a great housing trust fund, as you well know, that are always short in terms of the dollars that they actually need. And Joe's right, putting more money into that at the state level would be one way to address that. But again, I think uh, more people like you meeting with local developers and explaining that this is also helpful to the communities in terms of providing incentives and making sure that people come here and find this a, a good place to live and a supportive place to live. Thanks. In the area of housing, 
Uh, one of the things I've become aware of, I've been pushing for home and community-based services, mm -hmm. is that a lot of our homes don't enable a person to stay there. That's right. And one area for housing and funding from the state would be a home modification program that would allow a person like myself, others, some kind of a tax credit for home modification. Because, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories when I came here way back in 65, one of the families that invited me to their home was an elderly couple. Uh, their only bathroom was upstairs. They were going up and down the steps on their bottoms. Uh, we figured out how they could, uh, off of their kitchen, have a bathroom, uh, not a bathroom, but a toilet, uh, and how they could convert their uh, dining room, which they never used, except when they invited the minister to come uh, for lunch, uh, into their bedroom. Now, the good part is I was able to tell them what they could do the bad part is the f husband died before any of those things could happen. But home modification uh, is a real area for housing. And Harry, Harry mentioned transportation. One of the things that uh, one of the groups that we had uh, through a group now called uh, Elevate Aging uh, had a series of uh, meetings across the state. And in transportation, one of the th problems that was identified was that volunteers well, not, are not covered by the Good Samaritan Act if they accept reimbursement for their mileage. And that would, you know, if that could be shifted somehow so that th those that uh, would have the Good Samaritan protection and still be able to get reimbursed for their actual expenditures would help. Bob, you know, when um, I moved, I moved to a place that had a zero entry in terms of being no. accessible that way. And I think, again, working with developers, because it makes sense for developers to do that, what is going to be better for elderly is also better for young families. If you think about strollers and all of those kinds of things that they deal with, it makes a lot of sense to build something that is accessible for all ages. And if you approach it in that way, and our whole development is that way. And I think, again, more developers are looking at that because it's marketable, and it is something that's desirable for families of all ages. And, and so the audience is Lynn Sandler, who I think is probably the most informed person, I'm sure, in Johnson County, but Maybe probably the state, the state yeah. and probably the <laughs> world or nation. But, uh, you know, Lynn has pointed out to me that fact that it's not just for the older yeah. people or disabilities, people. it's for uh, the young families, like you mentioned, it's mm -hmm. uh, for veterans, it's for people sure. who. Uh, even have short-term disabilities and accessibility. Let me now open the microphone up to anyone else who has not identified that they would like to ask a question, to ask a question, or to make a suggestion. I can come up and say some more. <laughs> huh? Well, let's... I can come up and say yeah. some more. Let me, uh, uh, are, there, are there any, I, I've been told that it keeps getting worse and worse as far as the possibilities of bipartisan cooperation. Is that correct? And what can you all, you know, I realize there's only five, you know, you're only five people, but how can you help establish better relationships with the 
Republicans <laughs> in your various Senate sessions, the Senate and the House? You know, you know, Bob, it's interesting that you would ask that because on the water quality issue with the schools and uh, pitting them against each other, um, my first contact about that, and I had no idea about it even going on, was from a Republican. And, uh, and Bobby Kaufman called and, and just texted and said, are you aware of this? And I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I'm opposed to it. And I've made it very clear to my leadership that I'm not going to support that. I'm just curious about where you're coming from and why do you think this is being proposed? And so, you know, we've had discussions like that. There are a number of Republican House members who we can and do work with. And they, I think the gas tax was passed because of that. Um, it was a coalition of Republicans and Democrats alike who came together. Um, as you know, we'd been stymied for literally years for that, to keep that from even coming up for debate. And it was one of those things where a lot of them had signed tax pledges that prevented them from getting on board to support the gas tax. But there were a number and enough of them who said, to heck with it, I'm, I'm gonna sign it anyway, I'm gonna go forward with this because it's the right thing to do. And they did. So I think there are more of those efforts being made and we are trying to do the best we can on the areas where we can. We can't find that compromise on everything but we can find it on some things, and the gas tax would be a good example of that. David, do I not remember correctly that didn't Bobby and you introduce some bills together? Yes. Do you think that's yes. a possibility? Well, I, I think, you know, to your general question is that there are still a number of Democrats and Republicans working together, working together on a daily basis. And I'll even name four of them just to get them in trouble with their own caucus. I mean, one of them is Brian Moore from the Maquoketa area. Another is Quentin Stanerson from the Center Point Urbana area. Uh, Chuck Soderberg, who retired, and Josh Burns. Now, what's interesting with the four gentlemen uh, from the Republican Party I just mentioned is they tend to be moderate. They tend to work with Democrats. We've had a relationship over the years that includes uh, a burger and a beer after a tough day at the Capitol, and we talk to each other. What disappoints me the most is those four three out of the four gentlemen are retiring or stepping down. And I know two of them are also, uh, two of them also are, are, the reason they're leaving is because of the far right faction within their own party. And one of the things that comes to mind with the people I just mentioned is the fact that we all work together in the House, it didn't even reach the Senate for the fight there, is to knock down the performance-based funding. And that's something that we all work together collectively uh, to make sure that it did not happen. It hurts our area especially, but frankly, it hurt the other Regent schools too. And it would also have an effect on our community colleges and private schools on how we all recruit students or how we get students in the right fit for them. So that's what we keep pointing to is the Regents based funding, uh, knocking that down and the collection of R's and D's that came together to put it to rest, I hope, for at least a little while in the House. I, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of good bipartisan work being done in, in the legislature, and you don't hear about it because it doesn't, it isn't the, fi the fight. You know, the fight makes the news. What are we, what are they bickering about? Um, the, but I do, I do, I am pretty concerned about the, the governor's attitude and his approach to stuff. I mean, Representative Masher and and uh, noted the, his rollout of this big new water quality initiative. Uh, our leader, our Senate leader, heard about it for the first time yesterday when the press called, right? This is a massive s proposal. He's calling it, I think the governor said in the stories, this is my biggest idea ever, or something to that. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> So he well, doesn't. I would agree he's, with that. He's, but it, it's his biggest. Well, I don't know. I think I think actually think his decision to privatize Medicaid uh, is yeah. is bigger, and he didn't consult anybody about that either, right? He closed a couple of mental health institutes over Republican and Democrat opposition. 
He vetoed the money that we agreed on for K-12 in July, bipartisan agreement, governor vetoes it. And I just think it doesn't, it doesn't create an atmosphere of, of, yeah, we disagree on stuff, but let's come together and work on it when the chief executive has this kind of my way or the highway uh, approach to kind of his, you know, he, he doesn't really care what we think on a lot he of the, really and doesn't. he doesn't really care what the legislature yeah, thinks. Right. Uh, or he would work behind the scenes to get people's support. And we might not agree on everything, but it wouldn't be as contentious uh, as it is. So I don't know, I don't have a solution for that, but I think at the legislative level, keep working with the governor. there's a lot of work at the legislative level that, that goes on that is bipartisan. But when he vetoed that education funding, the, the House tried to get an override of that veto. And a few Republicans would talked about signing on, but we certainly didn't have anywhere near needed to override that. So when push comes to shove, you know, they continue to support their governor, you know, the Republican governor. So that's um, part of the reality, too. Last opportunity for anyone that hasn't spoken. Here we go. Go ahead. question or anything. I just want to thank you all. I'm Ann Robot from the East Central Iowa chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, and I'm the director of programs and advocacy. So I just want to thank you for all the great work that you do, and I know it has to be really hard. And I don't really have a question. I just have something just to put on your radar is Alzheimer's disease. And there are currently more than 63,000 people living with Alzheimer's disease in the state of Iowa, um, 165,000 caregivers. And this is just going to continue to grow. And the cost of caring for someone with Alzheimer's is just outrageous. So um, we're just trying to educate everybody in the state to get an early diagnosis, to kind of know what to look for, but also maybe um, to consider maybe some tax credits for people that are caring for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. I know when people call me, respite is huge. Some of these caregivers just need some respite, and some of them can't afford it. They can't afford home health. They can't afford to put their loved one in a facility for a little bit of time. So it's just to kind of make you aware and kind of something to consider as you're going through. And I know you have a lot of tough decisions to make. So thank you. Thank you. Ta tax credits for caregivers uh, is a very valid and important issue. Uh, some of you know my uh, wife last month fell and fractured her neck. And all of a sudden, here I am, a caregiver. Yeah. And what I discovered was it's really not the physical task. You know, hey, I was preparing meals, you know, I was uh, making the beds. Uh, it, it was the emotional realization, I am responsible. Uh, and that was an, and, and for people that do that day in and day out, and, uh, and often the caregivers, uh, I know from my pastoral experience, often die before the person they're taking care of because they just wear themselves out and, you know, respite care, all those things for caregivers, uh, I hope will be on your priority. Bob, you got one minute. No. <laughs> Robert George, uh, just a plain ordinary voter, and um, congratulations uh, if you ran and won, and if you didn't, uh, then you'll take the blame for everything that you haven't done. So what we, Mike. Um, Main uh, point that I have is that I, I'm an educator, and I think you need to be educate the people. I would say that probably about 65, 70 people do not know what you do. They don't know the, what happens, why a bill cannot get to the governor to Veto is the only thing that they know. It's either been vetoed by the governor or it isn't passed. And nobody knows what happens to get it there and what has to need and what they need to do other than going to the polls. 
Well, they aren't going to the polls. You're looking at the census and seeing how many people are going to the poll, which is disgusting. There is, they just are not voting because they don't know. They really do not know and they figured their vote doesn't count and yes, it does. Yes counts, no counts, it's two. And until educated the voters, and I don't know how you're gonna do that, Sally, you talk about uh, education. Uh, I don't know if it needs to be done in secondary level or college level, but even both places, civic duties need to be taught and learned. I'm a political science major, and I know what it needs in all the other governments and our government needs to be done and what can be done to compare the, the differences. And it can be done, and it should be done. So if I, I'll give you an assignment. Just talk, keep talking, saying, well, we got the, the senators decided they didn't want to, 50 percent, or 50 senators said they would do it, then the Republicans didn't do it. Well, here you got half the government saying yes, and another half stopped it. Is that 50 percent? Is that democratic? No. Thank you. Robert, I was just going to mention Kids Vote. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but there's a program in Iowa City and across the nation called Kids Vote, and the whole idea behind it is on Election Day, um, they set up a polling site for children. So when they go to the polls with their parents, they are able to actually vote a ballot just like their moms and dads. And it's that whole idea of parents setting the example and taking their children to the polling sites. There's also a curriculum that goes with it. And that is one that is rich in how what voting is all about. They start with kindergarten, kinder, kindergartners with ice cream. So they see that that vote is what, what it means and how the classroom breaks out. And then they actually show them who the candidates are and then they talk about that in terms of what these people are running for, why it's important for them to participate, and when they get to do that. So they have something to look forward to and students are, are eager to do that. Our realtors are the ones in Johnson County who actually staff those polling sites that day and again reinforce that and, and encourage this the students as well. If you can get the parents to do it. Well, a lot of parents are going and they're taking their kids no, and the no, kids, no. are you ready for this? It's often the kids who say, mom and dad, would you parents. take me <laughs> yes. to the polling site because I want to vote. And they know they have that chance and opportunity. If they know, if they know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, but still, parental supervision needs to be enforced. Yeah. We won't get into that subject at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that's how we can't go. Can I say, can I say one thing? This, this meeting is actually an opportunity for us to talk about policies that we're working right. on. I mean, right. uh, yep. we have our friend Coral TV, Coralville TV's covering this. This We share an information with you. It'll get out on the video. I, I always think about this. Our jobs is about 50 to 60 percent is doing community education about what we're working on, right? I mean, the gas tax. We had to spend like 10 years trying to explain right. why we needed to raise the gas tax. And a lot of our job, I think, is is doing exactly the kind of education you were just talking about. And all the legislators would be happy to add your name to their mailing list. That's right. And they will send you regularly uh, information as to what bills they're working on, what their views are. And if you don't know how to contact them, it's their names with a, like it's Joe dot, dot Balkan at Legis, L E G I S dot Iowa dot G O V. We're on the web. I just go to the okay. Iowa Legislature. They have all our email addresses at the homepage of the Iowa Legislature. And so let me thank all of you for coming. And let me thank five of you for coming. And, uh, I hope you have a very, very productive uh, 2016 legislative session beginning Monday, and uh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We do too. Thank you.
Alright.